So we have two of the very top uh, global experts, global economic experts, also two women from the Fortune Most Powerful Women list. Thank you both for being here. We're gonna start, as we like to do, sort of like the big get to know you, we like to get to know our panelists uh, as well as talk about issues. So Wei, I'm gonna start with you. So Wei Sun Christensen is CEO of, for Morgan Stanley in China and co-CEO of Asia Pacific and fascinating career because she's tracked the entry of China. She grew up in Beijing, um, went to school at Amherst, the first mainland China uh, woman to graduate from Amherst. But tr her career has tracked the entry of, the, of China into the global economy. Um, and you actually helped with the regulatory structure for Chinese companies listed on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange early on. So you know a lot about China. But she also has kind of a fashion bug. And uh, she ended up joining the board of Estee Lauder, Lynn. Is Lynn still here? Uh, Patty and I happened to be with John Mack, the former CEO of Morgan Stanley, a week ago, and he was raving about you. And he had to break a rule of Morgan Stanley to even let you sit on a board because of all the conflicts of interest in an investment bank. But how has that experience been? Well, it, it is great. And uh, first of all, I have to, uh, uh, you know, also thank Lynn. <laughs> And uh, because uh, she was one of the very strong voice within as Lauder board and recommending me and also pushing Leonard Lauder to really make a plea to Morgan Stanley. I'm very grateful for the firm to give me the opportunity as Lauder is such amazing company. I've learned so much and uh, especially at the time that when we're building business and the governance standards and uh, where I come from is very different. So to have the first-hand experience sitting on the board and uh, to learn about the best industry practice from this fantastic company is great. Plus, it's a lot of fun, you know, we're yeah, talking yeah. about makeup and uh, yeah. all this stuff, you know, <laughs> fantastic. And Anne, you, um, you're a graduate of Sheffield University. You are executive vice chair of MasterCard. But in fact, you're kind of an engineer by background. You studied math. Mm -hmm. Was it physics too? Math, chemistry. Maths. Well, math, physics, and chemistry before university, but pure maths at university. And what I love about Anne's background, she was the first woman ever uh, worked, to work in the UK on an offshore oil rig. Tell us how that went. Well, I mean, it was great fun. I loved working outdoors. And, uh, and when, I, when I actually told the head of offshore engineering I'd love to do this job, he said, you do know that you have to pass your offshore secure, you know, safety certificate, which involves putting out kerosene fires, uh, escaping underwater from drowning helicopters. Being dropped, like yes, dropped into dropped, the sea. Dropped into yeah. the sea. And I said, yeah, but that's just the fun bit. <laughs> So I love the life. I love. And you almost you your your uh, uniform or the uniform the underwater thing didn't oh, fit yeah, right yeah. because you were I too had small. I had a I had a man's small rubber suit survival suit and when they threw me in the North Sea and all it was April it was freezing uh, I nearly got exposure because all the water just rushed into this suit through the the face area which just was too big for a, a woman so they had to make me. Uh, a new suit, especially for me. I love that. Which I subsequently left on a train to Charing Cross and then had to go to Lost Property and say, I've left my rubber suit on the train. <laughs> and the guy from Lost Property said, uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so to more serious stuff, let's go to the global economy way. Um, you know, the, the Economist had a big spread this week or last week on, on the jobs boom in the world. Uh, for all of our concerns about volatility and uncertainty in the markets, unemployment uh, is at record lows in industrialized countries, the UK, the US, um, Japan, uh, and employment's at high. I mean, the record high. The US is moving into a, one of its longest uh, periods of expansion, but there's still that volatility, um, trade, and we're not allowed to use the word trade war, trade tension, <laughs> bet between the US and, uh, and China, what's going on? 
Well, when we talk about a global economy, I think it's important to look at the U.S. because it does provide some directions. And uh, in U.S., I think the core fundamentals are quite strong. As you said, that 3.6% uh, of uh, unemployment rate is very impressive. But most importantly, uh, there is it's coupled with the rises in um, wages. So that is a very nice combination. And uh, in addition, the consumer sentiment and spending has um, also rebounded, and uh, uh, there is this very muted inflation, and uh, we don't anticipate that the Fed will uh, raise uh, interest rate before the end. Uh, so those are the good news, and but there is a still a downside risk, uh, as you and point out. And the trade, uh, talk about how you see that playing out, this trade war, war tension between the U.S. and China. Well, the trade tension, uh, as, as you pointed out, is not a war, it's a tension. We made that uh, distinction, a quite uh, important distinction very clearly, because if there were a trade war, we will be all in much worse, uh, big trouble than now, because China and United States, uh, you know, with the second largest uh, economy in combination represents 40% of a global economy, which is the size of 80 trillion. So U.S. is 21 trillion, China is 13, and the distant three, Japan is five trillion. But, uh, you know, so the, these are the facts that we have to face. These two countries represent the, the largest uh, you know, global economic growth and also the dominant economic trades. So when these two countries are in sort of a, you know, kind of a battle and uh, they have a tension and the escalation of the tension and the re-escalation of the tension that happened recently, is not good for us, it's not good for the world. We'll be all actually feeling the pain because these two countries actually are dependent on each other more than you know. You know, China surplus in goods, U.S. surplus in service, and they rely on the consumers of respective countries to really absorb that supply. And uh, also, with the decades of globalization, the, the industrial supply chains have changed. So, in fact, when we talk about goods made in China, it's a very different concept now than before. 2017, China export total number is $506 billion to the United States, out of which 60%, 60 percent, six zero, represents goods made by multinational companies operating in China, either wholly owned entities or joint ventures. So this is really not products made by the Chinese companies being, uh, being heard and uh, created. This trade war uh, is really a global uh, situation that we have to really deal with. And thirdly, I think uh, this is the time that we need a reset about the relationship between the two countries because China, 20 years ago was an economy of 1.1 trillion only. And uh, it's really hard to say China had much impact outside its country. But now, as a second largest economy, so what China is really thinking is how to engage with the rest of the world. And that has evolved as well. So therefore, this trade war, it is not about how to trade and on what terms are we having the trade. It is about a negotiation on the new terms of arrangement between the two countries. So this negotiation process could be seen as a process of two largest economies of the world and then trying to really uh, reach a kind of agreeable terms of engagement and try to coexist with each other. Yeah. That's what this is about. And Anne, what's uppermost on your mind? We were talking about the rise of nationalism globally. What, is that what worries you the most? Well, it, it's very interesting to hear Wei's comments because, you know, ultimately uh, we're trying to serve the consumers around the world. And, uh, and what I see as I travel around the world is people are becoming more similar 
but governments are becoming more polarized due to nationalism. And, and we've got something like 2.5 billion consumer products out there in the market. And so we're looking at the whole global trade and supply chain space and saying, how can we assure that everybody gets what they need around the world with these big global supply chains? And so we're th obviously we're a big technology company, so we're working with the technological angle of it, of saying, uh, let's work, we're working with Microsoft and we've built a global directory that has 220 million companies loaded on there. From big, huge companies to small companies and remember that women are running many of the SMEs around the world. And through these kind of global directories we can allow them to trade. But obviously it's very important that we ensure that the agreements that Wei is talking about are actually reached between the governments. In her case, she was talking about the US and China, but we know sitting here in Britain that because of Brexit, we may be in a situation that we are negotiating our own trade agreements outside the EU if that happens. And so this really is a global issue and it's in all our interests to solve it. And it's going to be a fantastic U.S.-U.K. trade agreement, I heard, out of the White House. Just lovely. <laughs> okay. So um, AI is something that's on everybody's mind. It's going to shift and is shifting the global economy. And you're part of the AI Council here in London. You've made an interesting comment where you say it can't be the Internet of everything if it's not the Internet of everyone. Um, tell us about that and how that connects to your concerns about AI. Yes, I mean, obviously, we've been looking at things like financial inclusion, and, uh, and the World Bank stats on that are, are, are good. You know, more people are included in the financial system over the last few years, an extra half a billion. MasterCard itself have actually uh, committed to delivering half a billion people into the system be between 2015 and 2020, and we're already at about four, 400 million, so we're well on track. But you know, you can't be included into the financial system unless you've got some means to connect. And today, for example, there's 600 million people with mobile phones that don't have bank accounts. So obviously, you've got to build mobile products that work on mobile phones. But then if you think about it, how do you reach people in remote areas of Africa and in India and in different places around the world? And, you know, how do you get them included when you're busy rolling out 5G across the world and everyone's going to be con connected up? Um, this is an issue that, you know, a lot of thought and attention has been putting, put into. And I think that what has to drive that is innovation. Um, and what actually has to, uh, it, it's a two-way street in that the lack of inclusion also makes you come up with more innovative things. And probably at the heart of all of this is an identity. 1.5 million people on the planet today don't have any type of identity, digital or physical. And um, so if you're born, a woman born in Africa, you don't have a passport, you don't have a driver's license, you don't have a bank account, um, you know, you, you don't have a birth certificate. So the thing is, how do we create digital identities of the future that work for everyone? And speaking of divides, where you had concerns about AI creating more of a divide. Yes, uh, if there is um, uh, such a divide, I think this is between developing countries and the developed countries, right? Because as we know that uh, AI is extremely effective in helping driving productivity in the developing countries, and that is obviously a huge challenge. It's about economic growth and growth driver and the, product, and the increase in productivity, uh, and the AI is very effective. However, in developed, uh, developing countries, uh, then it's a very different story. So where people actually uh, are more focused at playing catch up on the best industry practice and uh, the growth of uh, you know where I come from, from uh, Asia for instance, a lot of the countries actually, a lot of growth coming from the structural changes and the reforms and uh, policy uh, support uh, coming from this country. And uh, so therefore, AI will 
as it's being developed in the developing country more uh, quickly will create the you know the gap and the increase the you know in, in, enlarge the gap and the polarize uh, to a certain extent the, the differences between developing and the develop, uh, developed countries even more we have time for one question anybody yes stand up and I, tell us who you are keep our the answer. Hi, Sigrid Johannesson, working for the Dutch government in Washington. Uh, thank you very much for your, uh, sharing your views. Um, one of the most dark scenarios uh, as an outcome of this trade war uh, could be two internets, two separate internets, and Chinese one and an American one, which will also lead to two separate markets. Um, what can be the role of Europe in this, because we're caught right in the middle? I think it, you know when you talk about the two internets, actually it's uh, very interesting because I do have a, a scenario of the two internets in China that I want to share with you. But before I go there, so uh, I think that actually Europe and the UK can play a very criti critical role. I think as China and the US are very much caught up in this uh, very intense uh, you know negotiation, and uh, there is so much. Uh, uh, escalation, sometimes tension building up. I think we need a more rational voice and we need a different perspective. We'll look at globalization, we'll look at the impact of technology and look, look at uh, this whole uh, issue about uh, what people are afraid of. And I think a lot for choose needs to be told. I think this whole negotiation reflect one point uh, that, uh, of course, both governments know what they're doing, but at the same time, uh, I think that there is misunderstanding. For instance, in China, two internet means there is a consumer internet, there is a technology internet, uh, industrial internet. The industrial internet, China is actually lagging way, way behind the United States. The IT service spending of China is only 18% of that of uh, enterprises in the United States. But yet, you know, because all these fears that are created about China become a technical, uh, technological giant to displace the United States, actually, I think is unfounded, if you look at that data. But of course, the consumer internet is a different story because you have 800 million consumers, 98% of that uh, is using smartphone. Different from US, 75% is using smartphone, the rest is using PC. So that means the Chinese consumers that have easy access. And, uh, and also, you know, in China now, you have the super apps, which you don't have yeah. elsewhere. Su yeah. The super apps actually means that you really have access to all different kinds of services by entering into one service. So there are things that China is doing scary and growing really fast, but there are also things that the China is, is, is trying to play catch up. To catch I up think on. That, yeah, that reality needs to be told. So, question for both of you. Are you gonna be at the reception <laughs> and dinner? Please. Unfortunately, I'm not. Okay, well, Wei is. Yeah. Um, well. This was just an appetizer for the discussions of the global economy, so I hope, I'm sorry we have to end it here. I hope you will seek out these wonderful women and talk more about it. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.